So it means you need to get about that close. Okay, so no. Uh, so so one year I talk to him more. He's in transit. That's very bad.
is here. Victoria is new. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Good morning and welcome to a special town hall meeting. All of the candidates uh, vying for the MP seat in order to represent Victoria are here in the studio, save for one, and that is Arlo from the Libertarian Party. I want to just clear this up. Uh, Arlo is sick, unfortunately he cannot be with us today. We asked for his campaign manager to step in, but we decided since this was an all candidates forum and not an all party forum, that it would not be fair to the other candidates. We offered Mr. Lowe the opportunity to provide a statement that we would read in the program today. He has declined to do that, saying that uh, if he couldn't debate or his team could not debate, that they would decline our invitation. So we will not be hearing from Art Lowe today from the Libertarian Party. However, uh, we obviously will mention his name and encourage you to consider his name on the ballot uh, when you vote on Monday. By the way, just a note on voting, it's 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You're going to hear me say that a couple of times throughout the day. We just want to make sure that nobody shows up at the polls at uh, 7.30, thinking it's an 8 o'clock close. So please do remember, it's 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And as Elections Canada has put out, should the polling place change, they do not call individuals. Uh, and uh, tell them that the polling place has changed. We're going to put that out there just in case something strange should happen. We know that that course would never happen in Victoria. <laughs> so uh, we have the other five candidates uh, in the studio uh, here and the live studio audience. We're taking your calls for the candidates. The number to call 250-386-1161, star 1070 on your cell, or you can send us an email talk at cfax1070.com. We welcome your questions and the issues that you really want to put to the candidates that are running to be MP, replacing Denise Savoy, who recently resigned. We have the candidates sitting uh, beside me on both sides, and um, although you're obviously not going to see that on radio, but uh, for the folks here, uh, just a little bit of the formality, we've set them in alphabetical order. That's how you're going to hear their opening statements this morning. We're going to give them one minute, and first up, we're going to uh, introduce to you, good morning to Dale Gann from the Conservative Party. Good morning. Good morning. You have one minute to make an opening statement. Thank you. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm... Uh, Born and raised in this lovely city. I was born here in 1968, a fourth generation member of this community. For the past 10 years, I've totally dedicated my life to working in the knowledge economy and creating jobs. For the past 10 years of my life, I've worked with industry, academia, governments of all colors, governments of all levels, with the true focus of helping strengthen our economy, with the focus of helping keep our kids here working, with the focus of building companies that offer jobs. I believe this by-election is an opportunity. Governments create environments for us. Governments create opportunities for us. It's up to us as a region, it's up to Victoria to create a plan for us to work within that environment. And I want to be part of that <coughs> voice in Ottawa for you. I look forward to this morning's debate. Fantastic. That uh, is Dale Gann from the Conservative Party. Thanks for staying with us in one minute. Uh, appreciate it. Now moving on to the Green candidate uh, running in this race. Uh, good morning to Donald Galloway. Good morning, Donald. Good morning. The question that arises in this debate this morning is whether you can trust us to represent your interests well in Parliament. 
I think that there are three reasons for trusting me to be your next MP. First of all, I have the experience to advocate on behalf of those who have no voice or little voice in, in Parliament. I will represent you strongly because that's what I've been doing over the last few years for others. I am a lawyer, but I am not a lawyer that takes clients. I'm a lawyer that pursues causes. And that's what I will do for social groups within, par within Parliament, social groups re representing the needy of Victoria. The second reason for trusting me is I've linked myself to the most popular politician in Canada, the Parliamentarian of the Year, Elizabeth May. Elizabeth May and I have worked together closely. Thirdly, I have a sense of what it is to be a successful MP. I don't have to re reply to a party leader. I have to reply directly to you. Thank you very much, Don Galloway. Now we move to the candidate running for the Christian Heritage Party, and that is Philip B. Good morning, Philip. Good morning, Victoria. I have to thank you, CFAC, for including me. In three major meetings, I was going to be excluded, so my hat is off to my colleagues who insisted I was part of this. And indeed, I am part of this. I have practiced in Victoria since 1968. I have taught in five medical schools in various parts of the world. I've started up SALTS that many people know, and now HERTS, and I have been on the school board, Composting College Council. I am against bigger government, I am against more taxes, I am against globalization, and Agenda 21, that most people don't know about it, it's about depopulation, that much of our government is supporting. And you better be aware of that, I am for more children, because we have to have more children if we're going to have a growing economy. You cannot run a free market economy without increasing population. And so depopulation is the wrong way to go, and I am much against it. And all my colleagues, they want more funding. You're not going to get more funding. Our country is broke, and we're going into debt. Thank you. <coughs> now we we'll move on to the candidate running for the New Democratic Party, and that is Murray Rankin. At one minute. Good morning, Murray. Thank you very much for having me. I'm the NDP candidate. Uh, I've lived in this community for 35 years. I hope to succeed Denise Savoie, who was such an excellent member uh, for this riding. Uh, my main issue is standing up to Mr. Harper's reckless agenda, both in respect of environment, cutbacks to social programs, the China investment deal, and in particular the Enbridge Northern Gateway project, which I think most Victorians utterly reject. I want to be part of the largest uh, opposition, official opposition in 30 years and stand up every day to Mr. Harper in the House of Commons. I'm an environmental activist and an environmental lawyer, and I believe I have the skills necessary to do the job. Thank you, Murray. Roy. You guys are short this morning. Just by the way, I just want to clear up any confusion uh, to Philip and anybody else listening today that Philip's comments about including him in the event today, by the way, actually came from CFAX 1070 and CTV. We wanted to ensure that everybody was included <coughs> in this all candidates meeting, so we, uh, we didn't want to exclude anybody. We now move to our final candidate making their one minute uh, opening statement, running for the Liberal Party of Canada. Say good morning, please, to Paul Somerville. Paul. Good morning, Victoria. Uh, my name is Paul Somerville. I'm the federal Liberal candidate uh, in this uh, election. I'm an adjunct professor uh, at uh, the University of Victoria, and I'm against uh, the Enbridge pipeline. Uh, but I'm trying to stop the secondary sewage treatment plant, what I call the billion dollar boondoggle from being built. And the reason is simple. My campaign has been based on one single issue, uh, and that is that public policy needs to be evidence-based, it needs to be scientifically and fiscally responsible. And the reality is that the billion dollar boondoggle, which is being imposed by the Harper government and supported by the NDP, is fiscally irresponsible and provides no net environmental benefit. But what I pick up at the doorsteps over the last four or five weeks is a terrible impact this is gonna have on families and businesses in Victoria as a sewage tax prices families and businesses out of our great city. A vote for me is to stop the secondary sewage treatment plan. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it. Uh, five candidates uh, making their opening statements in addition to the candidate that is not here with us today. Uh, Oglo from the Libertarian Party. We'll take a quick break. When we come back to our town hall meeting, we are going to discuss one of the issues in the news today, the, con the uh, Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Victoria coming out and saying they support, this is uh, their words, they support sewage treatment. You're listening to a live town hall meeting with the candidates running for MP in Victoria. I'm Stephen Andrew.
Celebrating their 150th anniversary, Fab presents the Innovations in Scottsdale on now at Sawyer Sewing Center. The sewing machine starting at $249. Purchase the heavy duty Fab Limited Edition Select at $499 for the limited edition expression at $1099 and receive a free Fab Anniversary Kit. Plus, all Fab and Parker machines are on sale. Great financing available on AC during the Fab Innovations in Style event at Sawyer Sewing Center. Hi, this is Terry Moore. Join us this Saturday, 4 to 5 p.m. for Motorline with Mike Salkis of Speedy Auto. We'll talk about a full range of automotive care, from brakes to transmissions, keeping you up to date on everything you need to know. What to consider as the seasons change, maintenance tips, repair orders, and what Speedy, if you're a somebody, if you're somebody who needs to know this information, so Motorline is Mike Salkis of Speedy Auto this Saturday, 4 to 5 p.m. at CFAX, but 10 to 7 a shared passion for power and performance and innovative yeah. techniques that's what yeah. every sales and must part of. That's what must part of a dealer. Every sales and must part of a dealer. That's what 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 must part of a dealer. That's how Bell makes streaming video better. <coughs> Claire from Burlington asks, I'm looking for a new super phone that can stream video without buffering. Any suggestions? Claire, you should consider the Samsung Galaxy S3. It has a beautiful large screen and a super okay. powerful processor. Plus, with Bell, you get blazing fast LTE speeds that make video streaming smooth and fast. The Samsung Galaxy S3 deserves Canada's largest LTE network. Visit a Bell store for details. Bell, streaming video just got better. The biggest movie screen in all of BC is giving you the best value in town. IMAX annual passes are on sale now. See all the IMAX films you want anytime you want for one low price. New for 2013, every pass includes admission to the IMAX Film Festival. And for a limited time, a concession coupon worth over $10. Get your IMAX Victoria annual pass at the National Geographic Store or at IMAXVictoria.com and go big. Introducing the online mall at waterboards.ca. Just in time for the holidays. Now you can do all your shopping online and earn your rewards points from your favorite online stores like Old Navy, Lids, the Apple Store, and more. You'll earn one more rewards point for every dollar you spend. Plus, earn three extra points per dollar when you pay with your More Rewards MasterCard. The online mall at morerewards.ca. No other mall offers you more. On CFAX 1070. We have five of the six candidates running to be the next uh, MP in Victoria in the studio. I said that we were going to talk about uh, sewage when we come back. This seems to be a big, uh, big issue. Not only uh, is it uh, on the minds of our candidates, but also on the minds of tourism. Victoria and the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce today have come out in support of sewage treatment. Now, this next part of the uh, debate, I mean, I want to shake it up a little bit. I don't want it to be stained. I'm going to ask a question of one of you. About 20 seconds uh, to an answer, and after 20 seconds, uh, please feel free to jump in and discuss it amongst yourself, and I will try to moderate. Uh, another thing I would ask is that you please don't jump out of your chairs and uh, punch the other guy. You know, I'm going to keep this very friendly and fun. It's been so like this morning. Again, if you would like to join the conversation, we will get to your calls as soon as we can at 250-386-1161. So, um, it's been quite a race in the past couple of days. I mean, uh, Murray Rankin, you have been uh, endorsed by a giant walking turd. I don't know if that's uh, <laughs> uh, a plus or a minus. You are you you appear to be obviously solely in support of this going along with the, the folks at the Chamber and Tourism Victoria. Um, are you hearing any difference once you've gone into this campaign that this may not be a good, such a good idea now? You know, I've been very pleased to see the Georgia Strait Alliance, uh, David Suzuki Foundation, Eco Justice Sierra Club, the environmental community agreeing it's time to get on the secondary treatment. But I, I was particularly buoyed as well, as you said earlier, that the Chamber of Commerce in this community, I spoke to uh, Bruce Carter yesterday, and Tourism Victoria have come on board in agreement that it's time to do the secondary treatment job. So yes, I think it is time to do so. And yet, your, one of your opponents, which is uh, Paul Somerville, has made this his campaign. And you know what, uh, Paul, I have to ask you, if you 
get elected on Monday uh, and uh, manage to delay this thing uh, in the past couple of weeks, then what are you going to do for the next uh, rest of your term? Well, of course, as you know, Stephen, uh, I've attended all the 11 uh, debates that we've had. Uh, if you go to my website, you see that what this campaign about is about is that public policy is based on evidence and not ideology. Uh, we've advocated for the legalization, regulation, commercialization, and taxation of marijuana. We've advocated for an annual, a guaranteed annual income. We've advocated against mandatory sentencing. We've advocated against the Enbridge pipeline. We've advocated against the trade uh, deal with China. There are lots and lots of things we've been talking about. It's not Paul Somerville. It's the people of Victoria that have made this mad plan, the billion dollar boondoggle, the number one issue of this campaign. That's what's happened. So this, this uh, job that we're applying for is, is critical cardinal role, that you listen to your citizens and you never lose sight of uh, representing their voices. And you do it in a way that you look at it financially, environmentally, scientifically, and socially. What we've heard and what we know is that the citizens and the scientists say Mother Nature's looking after it. What we hear and what we know is they're saying that we cannot look after it forever. I've not met one person that wants to pollute the beautiful streets and want to do that. But, you know, I mean, uh, Darian, I have to say to you, though, that this seems to be opposite to what your party is doing. Where is your party on this? Why would not hear anything from Stephen Harper, your leader? I mean, other uh, MPs for the other parties have been in uh, supporting their positions. Where, where has the party been supporting your position? About a year ago, I presented to the Western Economic Diversification uh, Minister for Federal Government that this region and any region in Canada must approve revenue enhancing infrastructure projects and projects as well as cost ones. We have to look after our backyard. Five weeks ago, I was the president of a tech park. Now I'm a, uh, running as a candidate in a, a by-election to represent the voice of Victoria. I have made Ottawa aware of my position. But Dale, what, what do they say? What do they say? What do they say? Yeah, do they support you? They have, my, my position has been heard and it's been considered. But Dale, your yeah. position is absolutely irresponsible. You stood up for four weeks in front of public audiences and you were the biggest advocate for this plan and then you magically discovered the science as your campaign was being attacked by your own party members. You foolishly flipped. The so reality so is, the reality is, is that you didn't know the science when you entered this campaign. I would like to jump to in. say that the scientists are- I could jump in, please, Martin. I think that uh, a week ago today, uh, I was being briefed by the CRD. Sitting in with me in the room was Dr. Andrew Weaver and Elizabeth May. The three of us decided that we would take a joint stance on this, pro on this problem. I would much prefer to have our local Nobel laureate uh, on my side than Mr. Floaty. The, the position that Andrew Weaver has stated in his Facebook page is that there is something deeply problematic about our uh, proposal. If the most serious issue is the flow of contaminants into our pipelines, then the current proposal only deals with 50% of those contaminants. If that's the concern, then we have only got a partial solution that is costing a fortune. Let me uh, just, so uh, I, I will get to everyone who said thank you, Don Galloway. Let's just go to Murray Rankin while I want to go. Well, to suggest that the scientists are all of one view is, pat is patently false. David Suzuki is a scientist who came out and agreed today that we need to get on with it. Not in true. addition, Not true. to get on with the treatment to no longer, in his words, use our ocean as a dump. Those were the words he used. But the predication, this entire decision of the provincial government was predicated on science. We've had scientists since 2006 studying this. There's a number of reports to suggest unanimity in the scientific community is patently false. So Sorry, Rankin, why don't, Mark, Rankin, why don't we wait just a little bit longer and see if we can get some consensus about get some consensus among the scientists. Getting consensus among scientists is like getting a consensus amongst economists. So what are you saying is those, are you saying then, Murray, that those who are pro sewage treatment are the only ones with the correct Absolutely, opinion. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there is a dissonant difference of opinion without doubt on the science, but the science that, on which this is based is clear. Philip it's May. clear for a community of pragmatism. I am a skipper of sail on that water, I'm a scuba diver, I dive in that water, I'm a physician, I know about bacteria, but what do we do in the country? We have septic tanks. 
and that is primary and secondary. What comes out of the effluent of a septic tank can go straight into the water. The solids can be used for fertilizer, and it is far less expensive. <coughs> Expecting the federal government to give you money won't happen. So it's a pie in the sky, gentlemen. To say that the science is divided is absolutely untrue, and to say that the science is definitive is untrue. There was a report done in 2006, the CTAC report, which was very clear that the science was unclear that there was no net benefit uh, from uh, a land-based uh, strategy to deal with our secondary uh, sewers. The reality is there's, a, there's an army of marine biologists, people who love the oceans, public health officials, who have absolutely unequivocal that there's no net benefit from this strategy. Okay, Paul, so I'm now I'm gonna go to Dale Gannon, and I'll come back to you. Well, and I find it interesting that we're running again for jobs to represent our city and our beautiful region, and Paul, you say to me, that you're concerned that I've changed my mind and that I'm being integral to this community. And I, I agree that the science and the engineering community haven't decided how to fix the problem. Why are you happy that I'm doing that? Is this is about Victoria. This is about taxpayers' dollars. I'm concerned that you, you I'm concerned that you would this stand is about up. About Victoria. I'm concerned that you would stand up in a public me. debate for four weeks and be an advocate for a mad plan that's going to cost a billion dollars with no net environmental benefit that's going to push businesses and families out of our city, and you okay. didn't know the science. That's let's, what worries me. Let's go to Don Gill. I think that what the people of Victoria are looking for is leadership here, leadership on a federal level. After our briefing with CRD, Elizabeth May and I decided that should I be elected, the first thing we will do is approach three branches of government to get them on site and to identify some clarity in this situation. DND, can they provide us with land near our heartland? Fisheries and oceans, can they provide us with some breathing space so we don't have to decide immediately? Environment, can we actually figure out what the, the level of contamination that is appropriate should be? Basically, the people of Victoria don't want us to act as scientists because we are not scientists. Okay, they now want us I want to go back down the line here because we've just got a couple of minutes. And uh, what I'm going to do is ask each of you, do you think, uh, first, my first question to you is, do you think that we should still treat our sewage? And if not, uh, what should we do? And I need you to be brief because I need to get through everyone. Dale, I'm going to start with you. Yes, we should get on with a plan to treat our sewage, but not this plan. This okay. plan is not right. I agree with that view. I think that this, this plan is a flawed plan. It is only partially effective, and it has, if we actually adopt this plan to have add-ons later, will be impossible and costly. Whatever way it is, it's going to increase taxes. We cannot afford to increase taxes. Our country is broke. Increasing taxes in Victoria, people will sell their houses, fewer tax payers, payers and down the very yeah. whole group. Yes, we should get on with secondary treatment. The only city north of San Diego of any size that doesn't. And secondly, I will work with the Capital Regional District to make it the most cost-effective response possible. When someone can show me a 21st century green technology that provides net environmental benefit that's financially responsible, I'm all for it. Okay, there. Hopefully that's uh, done the sewage thing to death uh, on this uh, part of the program. We will be taking your calls when we come back from the news, 250-386-1161, star 1070. You're listening to a special town hall meeting here on CPAX 1070. I'm Steve Murray. Yes, sunny break tomorrow. It's 9 degrees in downtown Victoria. Good morning. I'm Steve Dunning. Now, there may soon be an escalation of job action by local unionized uh, transit workers. Time, time, as time, 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 time. Okay, back on two minutes, everybody. Two, two minutes, minutes, please. please. Two minutes, 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 including disability, health, and life insurance. Williams told CPAC 1070s out there this morning. They were very, very upset because of this. My friends, on this radio station, they've been bringing up the Chinese building vicinity buses.
so far. They were only going to bet on yeah. uniforms and overtime. So you said the union will not continue to be committed all uh, a stats gap that came out today was this latest inflation in numbers. The DC rate is down. I should say the Victoria rate is down from 0.6 to 0.3 percent last year to October. I mean, DC rates also down from 0.7 to 0.5 while the national rate stayed the same. The first test of the job, we have to continue to do that rate. It's higher than anticipated by economists, given that gasoline prices went down here in a month. A proposal to ship Alberta oil to Eastern Canada is winning support among the premiers who are in Halifax to talk about the economy. Post Premier Daryl Dexter of Nova Scotia says shipping the oil east could boost Atlantic Canada's energy infrastructure. Manitoba's Greg Selinger has seen it as an opportunity to build national energy security. The Harper Conservatives are attacking the Liberal leadership candidate Justin Trudeau as the people suggest his popularity is growing. The Canadian Press Air Test Survey suggests Trudeau took over votes away from all parties, including the Conservatives. The Conservatives are bouncing on a two year old television interview to accuse Trudeau of being anti Alberta. Trudeau's people say that Conservatives are using out of context comments to launch a smear campaign. Egypt is set to hold separate talks today with Israeli and Hamas envoys on the next phase of the latest ceasefire. Hamas demands a lifting of all Gaza border restrictions, while Israel insists that Hamas must halt weapons smuggling. In Israel, a poll shows about half of Israelis think their government should continue its military offensive. A rare silver coin invented by colonial Massachusetts in 1652 and found in the field 23 years ago has sold at auction for $430,000. Only eight of the coins are known to exist. The woman who found it in the field sold it for just over $35,000 in 1992, and now says she wishes she waited a bit longer to sell. And the winners of the $46 million jackpot in the lottery 649 draw of nine days ago have come forward. Joanne and Dwayne Thompson of Lethbridge, Alberta, say they plan to use their winnings to retire, help their family, and donate to favorite causes. It was the third biggest lottery 649 jackpot in history. <laughs> CPAC News Time is 9.32. Glitter the magic of falling snow. Glitter and white tutus are the familiarity of that bright, iconic music. After the news at nine, we call them to listen to the betting residents on Chimo Place. Okay, folks, take your seat. Not getting an answer to our news poll question. So after the news at ten, our prize will be eight hundred dollars. Just reminding you that about one second, we just move on to eight, please. That would be great. Philip, we're going up. Low steady battery around at five, right now in downtown Victoria, it is nine degrees. Your home renovation project can be easy when you start at the finishing store. Visit them at 780 Topaz Avenue or online at finishingstore.com. I'm Steve Duffy. What's happening is here Victoria's News Authority, CFAX 1070, it's 934. Now, Stephen Andrew. On CFAX 1070. Welcome back to our town hall here live at our CFAX 1070 studios at the corner of Broad and Pandora. Five of the candidates running to represent uh, you in Ottawa are here to take your questions at 250-386-1161, star 1070. Email is up and running at talk at CFAX 1070. And the conversation continues on Twitter at CFAX 1070. We'll get to your calls in just a second. One of the candidates, I'd just like to remind you, is not here today, Art Lowe from the Libertarian Party is sick, so you will not be uh, hearing his uh, comments today. Candidates, just before you, you're going to be jumping in, just make sure that you identify yourself, because obviously here in the studio we know who's talking, but uh, at uh, home, in the car, at the work, uh, people are not uh, aware of what's going on. We're going to go to the phones right now. We're going to start things off uh, with uh, Ron. Ron, good morning. Welcome to CPAX 1070. Go ahead with your question and your issue this morning, sir. Thank you very much. Two weeks ago, the Vancouver Sun obtained an internal email from the Federal Fisheries Department that revealed a new organizational chart, and the new chart plus the Northern Gateway Liaison position reporting directly to its Executive Director of National Ecosystems Management. Now, this document exposes this, and the Harbor Conservative plan of putting the oil industry 
industry of head of BC fishing, tourism, and other coastal industries, as well as our pristine coast. So my question is, given this one secret political agenda, what will your party do to speak for our environment and coastal industries and stop this pipeline and associated oil tanker traffic, which a clear majority of British Columbians and Victorians do not want? Let's uh, start off uh, with Murray Rankin. Murray. I've spent the last year of my life volunteering as the legal advisor to Adrian Dix in the hope that if they become government, we can stop the Enbridge pipeline. I believe that the DFO report to which you refer uh, is frightening. It demonstrates that Mr. what Mr. Oliver has already told us, the, the Federal Minister of Energy, and that is that they believe it's in the national interest. Well, I don't, and I'll stand up against it. Gallagher. The Green Party of Canada, and myself in particular, have are the only, we're the only ones who are actually taking a, a solid opposition against all transportation of bitumen past our coasts. We're not just concerned about the Enbridge pipeline, we are concerned about the pipeline that will carry bitumen past our coast here in Victoria. Let's go to Dale Gant from the Conservative Party. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have to recognize that we're blessed as a nation to have resources. We must learn how to steward them in the most responsible, financial, environmental way. As a citizen, as a candidate, and, and someone that's listened to the doors, yes, people are concerned about the opportunity that it could damage our prestige pipeline, could hurt our coast. But let's listen to the independent body. Let's go forward and have that process completed. Let's all read it. Let's all think about it. And then let's take our collective voice to Ottawa after we've read the document. Let's go to uh, Paul Somerville from the Liberal Party. Well, we need uh, a rigorous uh, regulatory process, and it's pretty clear that the Enbridge pipeline, as I like to say through this campaign, is nuts. Where we differ from the Green Party, we have to remember that the global economy is $60 trillion in size, and the Canadian economy is $1.5 trillion. We have to trade, and one of our strategic assets is resources. We need to be smart about how we regulate tanker traffic and pipelines. We need to be able to think environmentally responsibly about how we harvest our resources and not basically just cut them off. And Philip Day from the Christian Heritage well, I taught at the University of Hong Kong. I think I understand Chinese. You're playing Chinese chess with a dragon. And I hope you understand we're not in a good position to bargain. We're selling our products at basement prices because the store is going broke. And we got to do that because of depopulation. Do you support Agenda 21 from the UN? I would like to know what my colleagues think about Agenda 21 from the UN, because the government has signed on to that. Anyone else want to comment on this? We'll go right to the phones again. Well, Listen, I'd, I'd, I'd like to add one more thing. I think, and, and Paul talking talk about Dale Gann right now. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, Dale Gann, I think it's really important to recognize how important resources are to our economy. They pay for our health care. They pay for our education. They're critically important. I think we just have to be responsible and go through this process and then talk about it as Canadians, British Columbians, and move forward. Don't, don't kind of I, for the Greens. I would just like to clarify the, the Green position. We are not advocating that we cut all, uh, all access to the tar sands immediately. We are going to wean ourselves from our dependence on a single source of energy. There is more investment in the world in low carbon energy than there is now in fossil fuels. Well, some of those levels. As I've been advocating through this campaign, we believe strongly that we need a carbon tax, and a carbon tax will reshape the Canadian economy and make it a 21st century economy less dependent on fossil fuels. But in the meantime, we need to be smart about how we harvest our resources and the regulatory process about how we harvest them and transport them. Let's go back to the phones. Uh, this time we're going to uh, speak with uh, Mehdi. Mehdi, uh, good morning. Uh, oh, I'm going to see if I can punch it up. Mehdi, good morning. I'm going to have to get the job. Mehdi, good morning. Welcome to CPAC's 1070. Your question for our candidates this morning. Good, good morning, Stephen. I am concerned that, you know, we are living in a prosperous country, but the fact that child poverty numbers coming out all the time, and it's really put us to shame. We should not have child poverty in this country. My question, I am a member of NDP, and my question is, why is it, uh, asking question from Mary Rankin, for 12 years we had the NDP government in Manitoba, and the child poverty in Manitoba is the worst. Why they are giving tax cuts to corporations, and, and so, so they don't, the government has, do not have money to spend on the issue of 
for child poverty? Why should we continue work for NDP when we see no changes in 12 years? They are the worst in the country in terms of child poverty. Okay, thanks for your call, Manny. Appreciate it. Let's uh, go to uh, Murray. This question to you, first of all, and then right. uh, everyone jump in after 20 seconds. It's tragic, as we heard just this week, uh, that one in seven children in Canada live in poverty. That means one in seven families live in poverty. And I think my role as a federal politician would be to collaborate better with the provincial governments because, of course, they deliver services, frontline services, to children in poverty. First Nations. Of course, the responsibility of the federal government. We need to work uh, closely with them. I'm committed to a poverty reduction act that so many provinces of all political stripes have, except the conservatives don't want to uh, admit this is a critical uh, problem in our country. Paul Somerville. Canada spends uh, about $130 billion a year on welfare supports, and our child poverty outcomes uh, over the last 15 years have got worse, not better. We know that child poverty results in bad education, health, and economic outcomes for those children. We need a guaranteed annual income. A guaranteed annual income would be part of an important uh, framework to instantly remove income poverty. So what would you, how would that work uh, for those that aren't familiar with guaranteed annual income? Well, it's actually based on the, the research uh, of Milton Friedman, the right-wing economist. He has something called a negative income tax. So instead of building a huge bureaucracy to manage the moral hazard uh, of welfare, where you've got welfare workers running around finding out where people, uh, who they live with and where they're working or not, uh, you instead pass it through the tax system. It's much more efficient and it removes federal bureaucracy. Phil this is paternalism, maternalism doesn't work. You're reinforcing, you're deliberately reinforcing maladaptive paths of behavior. And if you understand a process, you understand it can't work. So what are you suggesting then, Philip? I mean, do we, do we just leave these people to struggle for themselves, or do we try to help them? We need more children. More children create real jobs. More children could be more children in child poverty, and that just doesn't make sense. I'm asking you, what are we going to do with the people that are on welfare now? Let's well, say that you have a, a gay couple that are out there, um, and uh, they're, they're in a situation where they're, they're not maybe surviving. Do, do we ask them to go out and have more children? I mean, you, 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 your plan you doesn't seem to be... Are you an advocate? I'm asking you no, questions. No, I mean, I'm not just a moderator. I'm the host of this talk show, and I'm asking you a question. If you want to answer the question, go ahead. If you don't, that's I'll fine. I'll answer the question. You don't understand that people are an asset. Always, in every country. You go to the Philippines, Bill Clinton said, people are an asset. Do not get rid of your people. We need more children. Children create jobs, believe it or not. OK, but what I'm saying to you is, what do you do with people on welfare now? Do you, do you help them, or do you just leave them to fend for yourself? No, That's the question more, I'm asking. Can you have more welfare? It never works. Right. Okay, let's go to uh, Dale Gann. For the All right, uh, as an individual um, that's lived here, and, 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 and uh, we just had a homeless conversation recently, $900 is not an, enough of an annual, or a monthly income for anyone. You can't live and have a home and have food and live with $900. Right now, one of our senators, Hugh Siegel, is, is advocating a plan for this guaranteed income, and we are on and we should get behind them. It's tough. It requires all levels of government to come together, and I support this principle. The other important thing is we got to higher our education levels, and we got to bring those kids onto the bring opportunities to those kids and show we got to just. This is so important. It's absolutely important. Um, but nine hundred dollars is not enough for a single mom or family. And what about uh, so individuals? Yeah, individuals. Are you just talking about families or individuals? No, individuals. Okay, let's go to the uh, go to Donald Galloway. Can I get can I get back to Mehdi's question? And that is, why is it that the worst uh, situation is in a province where we have a socialist government? And I think that the the nature of the question suggests that in fact we are failing on this question, no matter how. Uh, how positive we are in terms of protecting social rights. And I would suggest that our failure is because we don't see ourselves as others see us. Others see us as 24th on the list of 35 countries. Others, such as the Committee on Rights of the Child, see us as failing to deal with Aboriginal uh, children, African Canadian children, the disabled. We need infrastructure to build a success. Paul Summerhouse. The Very reality, quickly, just got to go for a break. The reality is, Don, is I've heard you at a whole bunch of these uh, conferences, and you're the socialist. You know, you're the one who wants to shut down resource industries and prevent, uh, through a moratorium or a complete blockage of pipelines, resources going to the to the global economy. Your 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 strategies on the economy would be a disaster for Canada. 
Mararanka? Manitoba is a province with a very large Aboriginal population. The federal government has not stepped up and found creative solutions to deal with Aboriginal poverty in this country, and that's a crying shame. To talk, as, Ms. as my conservative opponent just did, about $900 being not, dollars not being enough, I remind him that that's a provincial responsibility. The federal government's Canadian social transfer gets less and less every year to help the provinces. More taxes. So, Debian, it means a very good question. Where is the conservative government on this? Well, it, I, I just give you an example. I just give you an example that we have a senator in our country fighting for for that. Hey, Dan, that, she, show she, me the money. Dan, that's that's not conservative policy. That's uh, really out there. And I mean, I'm glad that Hugh Siegel's taking that position on a guaranteed annual income, but it's never had been part of Harper's plan for Canada. Try and get more taxes from a declining population. It can't happen. Philip May, and finally Donald Galloway, then I've got to take a break. I would just like to uh, correct this, the, the statements uh, as the so-called socialist here. Uh, the Green Party uh, actually advocates the guaranteed annual income as well. But we don't want to just throw money at poverty. We want to deal with it in terms of institutions. We need to make some money right now. We'll do that. Be back with that. <laughs> 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 That's a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rotate all four tires, complete a funeral check on your brakes, and get your free roadside assistance for 120 days. It's about a minute and a half, folks. A minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Encourage maybe the provinces to, to revamp the welfare system. 
Well, obviously what we've seen provincially is not working. We've just uh, talked in the last few days about a report that isn't, uh, that is alarming, obviously. And so uh, it has to be a concern for uh, citizens in our community. And, and uh, I think that it has to be voiced into Ottawa and we have to work to see if we can get a better transfer of funds for from the feds to the Do you think that's possible? Well, I mean, you know, just, I mean, we well the it. option of leaving, leave, uh, the current status is not good. The report card is bad. So yeah, we got to get on with it. We're a caring nation. We, yeah, it's not good enough. No, what well, about your parties? I mean, the, the provinces have complained about your party's uh, funding of health care. I mean, and they, the, the provinces do, the finance ministers obviously uh, meet on a regular basis, say that the Conservative government hasn't really stepped up to the plate to the level that they need to deal with things such as health care. Obviously, if that creates more regret on provincial budgets, then they have to look to other areas to make cuts. Our, the federal government is committed to the provincial government. It's funding for five years with an annual 6% increase. Health care is one of the greatest concerns to our nation, the rising cost of it to our communities. It's, it's challenging, but the, let's, let's be sure and know this, the, the, the listeners. The federal government is committed to five years so that you can plan your health care in British Columbia with an, an, an annual 6% increase. Donald Gallagher in the Greeks. Uh, as I pointed out the other night in the uh, large omnibus budget that went through last session, the only reference to poverty was in the cancellation of a, not, uh, a national welfare advisory group, uh, whose job it was to advise the government on how to spend monies in this regard. I think that the government is clearly cutting back on social services, and I think that the job of the MP is to hold them to account, to expose what they're doing, and to expose the way in which they, they are wasting funding as well. The federal government has what they call a, the Canada Social Transfer. They make block transfers to uh, provincial governments, and they don't uh, they don't uh, uh, enforce the rules. You mentioned Stephen the Canadian the Canada Health Act, excellent statute, clear principles. The government of Canada doesn't enforce those rules. So when a provincial government like Christie Clark's decides to stand up for a two tier Medicare system, I'm going to stand up to Harper and demand that they enforce the Canada Health Act. That's just one example. All right, right. and now they're going to pull some of it. The best uh, welfare systems need to be designed as a hand up, not a handout. And what we need to do is change our tax system so that people who are on assistance can then go into the workforce, if they're capable and able, to earn money that isn't immediately taxed at the top tax rate. So one of the things we've been advocating along with the guaranteed annual income is that the next $5,000 in earned income is tax free. Right now what's happening is that first dollar that's earned is taxed at the top marginal rate. What you want to do is draw people out of the poverty trap which welfare creates and open the door to the middle class. Philip May from the Christian Heritage. Well, it's not as easy as you think. I don't know if people understand condition passivity. You give money or attention for sick, helpless behavior. You can't even diagnose a healthy report. You don't get paid for it. So we've got to encourage people to take charge of their health. We've got to encourage people, and it's not so hard, to take charge of their welfare. The welfare system has never worked anywhere. It deepens our debt. That means that people are out of job, and the whole thing spirals downward. We can only do it differently. My party is different. Anyone else want to make a call? OK, down. Um, let's talk about the economy right now. A little, bit, a little bit more. Obviously, I think one of the one of the biggest issues that faces us right now is the pressure of budgets. So I'm going to start. I'm going to go reverse. I'm going to start with you, Paul Somerville. What primary budget measure do you think that your government could bring in that could make a change that your party could bring in? And I need to give you each about maybe 34 seconds. Well, one of the things uh, that I talked about when I was chief economist of RBC Dominion, Canada's largest uh, investment bank, was the need to design. Uh, a tax system which steers the economy in a way that's environmentally uh, and economically responsible. And so there are a few things uh, that I've been talking about in addition to sewage. Uh, number one uh, is a carbon tax. We need to create a 21st century green economy that reduces its dependency on fossil fuels uh, because of climate change. Uh, we need to uh, legalize, uh, regulate, commercialize, and tax marijuana, which could raise, incidentally, about half a billion dollars a year here in BC alone. Let's go to Mark Rankin. I believe that we have 
and a vibrant $2 billion a year knowledge economy now in this city, and I salute the people who are the leaders that produced that result, we've got to build on it. The driver of our job creation has always been small business, and that's proving to be the case in Victoria. The New Democrats have advocated for a 2% cut in small business tax, and we stand by that. The last thing I'd say, Stephen, is Denise Savoie successfully introduced a small uh, a, a private member's bill that the real estate board here had encouraged called a capital gains rollover to incite or to incent people to produce rental housing. I think that would really, really be a boost uh, for our economy as well. Philip Dane. You look the world over and you'll find every economy in the world is going down as their population goes down. Population and economy go together. We need more children. There's no other solution. And killing children by abortion does not help because abortions are damaging to the women, check the science, and certainly don't help the economy. Okay, let's go to uh, Dale Gain. Well, I'm really glad that we had this question. It's one of the first times in this all Canada debate we finally talk about jobs in the economy and Victoria. For one that's been a champion for this region, internationally, nationally, locally, about job creation, I'm very happy we're finally talking about something that is so fundamentally important. And I thank you for the question. Um, listen, I, I, uh, I know this, that we as a community here in Victoria do not have an agreed, shared economic plan, and that is unacceptable. This region must get on and create our plan and align it with our government. Our government has put us in a fine, strong financial position. It has stated a key priority, jobs in the economy and small business. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the priority of our backyard. That's a problem. We see too many vacancy signs. Let's go to uh, Don Galloway, the Greens. For the Green Party, I think that uh, the budget changes would be first for the generation of re revenue. We need carbon pricing, absolutely clearly. The person who called it the mess should pay for it. In terms of the, uh, the spending of the revenue generated, we have to have a housing department. We have to have sufficient uh, funding dedicated in the social transfer to social services, particularly the need, the needs of the vulnerable, such as the elderly. I want to be very clear, it's Paul Somerville, that the, the, the most important strategic asset that Canada has is its people, uh, and that Canada's population is growing a little more than 1% on an average annual basis, which will result in 50 million Canadians by 2050, a current trend, in fact, there'll be more Canadians than Germans by 2080. We need to have a thoughtful and engaged immigration strategy. Okay. I agree with the immigration point, but listen, this is what I'm concerned about for Victoria. We rely on a government town, a tourist town, and a knowledge-based town supported by the best post-secondary education system in Canada. Other However, countries in the world are sorry. Philip May, we, we know who wants to Philip May. Other countries in the world resent us taking away their best brains. And they are angry about that. Besides which, they all have a uh, exponentially declining fertility rate. So it's going to grow. It's going to dry it up. We've got to have our own children. Okay. Let's uh, quickly go down the We can get to the wrong again. Well, as the uh, integration lawyer here, I think I want to say, of course, integration is a serious matter, and we have to do it properly. We have to take discretion away from the minister who thinks he knows best, and actually go back to a system that tailors our needs to the. Um, very quickly, uh, give me 10 seconds. Our government has a jobs plan. I've been a champion for creating jobs, and I want to know where the NDP jobs plan is. I've not heard it or read it. Okay, now we're going to have more questions when we come back at 250-386-1161, star 1070. Another half hour of this town hall forum. And then and, uh, if you would like to email me questions, talk at cfax1070.com. When we return from the break, each candidate in this room will have an opportunity to pose a question to another candidate. Find out what that is and how the candidate responds right after the news. Yes, Victoria. Victoria. 